Hello, everyone. So we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and welcome to Mueller Field Station's virtual Speaking of Nature series. My name is Ali Esposito and I am the Conservation Education Outreach Coordinator here at Mueller. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a little bit of background information. Mueller Field Station is a part of Finger Lakes Community College and the field station is located in the southern Honeyway Valley, just south of Honeyway Lake. And we offer a lot of different environmental education opportunities here. So there are Finger Lakes Community College conservation courses that are offered here where students come down to uh, carry out their own research and participate in field experiences. And we also have a K through 12 program and we host these different community outreach events as well. So uh, just an announcement, we do have our uh, next Speaking of Nature event scheduled for Tuesday, December 15th at 1.30 p.m. And there is a little bit of a time change. So typically these are held at night. This one's gonna be in the afternoon. And it is going to be on the topic of the Haudenosaunee land acknowledgement. And this will be presented by Michael Galvin. And he is um, from Gnandigan State Historic Site. So it should be a really interesting uh, topic and pre presentation and definitely a change of pace. So you can look for all of these updates and announcements and see what we're doing at the field station by following us on Facebook and on Instagram. And we'd really appreciate it if you did that. So uh, joining us tonight, we have Dr. John Van Neal, and he is the director of Mueller Field Station and is also a professor in the conservation department at Finger Lakes Community College. And tonight he will be sharing with us a bunch of amazing stories and photos that were captured using trail cameras. And he'll dive into how to use these devices, uh, the value that they, they give to us in research and in education. And they're just really enjoyable to you know, see what's out there and what are these animals doing. So I am going to pass it over to John and thank you so much, John, for putting this presentation together. I know that you'll probably have some comical anecdotes thrown in there for us to laugh at. So I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you. Hey, I'm going to share my screen with you. And we'll get this popped up and going. And I know Allie gave me an, an introduction, but I'll, I'll do a little bit. Uh, a little bit more of one. Sorry, I'm still manipulating what's happening on my on my end here. So, uh, as Ellie mentioned, uh, I'm the director of the Mueller Field Station. That's been since September 1st, but I've been at FLCC for quite a while. This is my 26th year there. And in the uh, advertisement for this, I said I've amassed over half a million uh, trail camera pictures, and it really was difficult to come here and not show you all of them. But hopefully, I pick the pick the best ones here. If, if I wanted to describe my job at the college, uh, it's incredibly wildlife focused. So the two pictures on the right of the screen, I'm holding a bear cub in one of my classes and I'm holding a red bellied woodpecker in another one of my classes. So we do both uh, uh, what we call invasive wildlife techniques where you're actually handing the animal and non-invasive techniques like uh, camera trapping, which is uh, obviously you're not handling them. And then the picture to the left uh, was a couple of Christmases ago, my wife and I, uh, went to India to a, a national park to see tigers primarily. Uh, so uh, I guess the other part of, of me is when I'm not teaching wildlife stuff, I am trying to do uh, recreational activities around wildlife stuff. So uh, so it's kind of singular focused. And the greatest thrill I get from seeing wildlife is then being able to capture images of them. So these are five pictures that I've taken on, let's see, three different continents here. And uh, I just absolutely love being able to take photographs, bring them back to the classroom and, and use them to uh, to teach my students. So camera trapping or, or trail cameras really is just an extension of that. So I look at the photos that, that I gather uh, in the in in the field as being just one other way that I can engage engage my students. 
I've used the term camera trap and trail camera interchangeably here, and let's at least make sure that you understand that. So trail camera is what you'll see in a catalog. When you go to a Bass Pro Shop or Dick's, you're going to see trail cameras for sale. But in the literature, uh, researchers use the term camera trap. And I absolutely just love that term because you really are trapping the animal in an instant in time, right? So obviously they're, they're speaking of this in the same way that, that a, a, a trapper, a fur trapper would talk about a lake hole trap, but we're just ca capturing them digitally at this point. And I will also point out that this is a little bit like the terms football and soccer. So in the United States, we call it soccer. And I think everywhere else in the world, they call it football. So we call them trail cameras here, but if you travel anywhere uh, uh, to any other country, they really use the term camera trap as their as their go to because that's how they that's how they learned of them through through researchers. So I try to use camera trap with my students uh, because that will make them sound a bit more uh, professional. These cameras are triggered what we call remotely, so no one's actually pressing a button. You you set them and forget them, like the George Foreman grill, I think. And uh, what they do is they detect heat in motion. And a, a way to describe that to you without getting into the weeds too much here is, I grabbed this off of a, a website, obviously you can see all their tra uh, trailcampro.com, and they're showing a Bushnell camera in this case. And they're showing you two cones here. The, the first one, the, the, the top one, the 75 de detection angle, that is the, the zone that an animal would be detected in. And when it walks into that area, it actually uh, gets triggered by the camera because the camera, if we want to say sees or senses, the heat in motion. And what's interesting is you can see that it will detect the animal before it's in the, even in the field of view of the camera. And I don't know how many times I've taken a picture and the first, like a series of three photos and the first one, you can't even see the animal yet because he's just about to get into the, into the field of view there. Uh, this is set up this way in case the animal's moving fast. Uh, you have a good chance of getting them in the, in the middle of the photo instead of just a, a tail end at the, at the right or left side there. So is that going to work for everybody? Uh, just that brief explanation. We could do a half hour just on how these things work, but I just wanted to make sure you, you understood that. And so with the idea that they're detecting heat in motion, you can see that it's possible that you would get false triggers. You could get leaves warming up in the sun and then the wind blows them and, and you get a, get a trigger there. And as I mentioned, uh, the trail cameras are, are what they're called in popular literature. And that commercial market is driven not just by deer hunters, but specifically by whitetail deer hunters. So whitetails are found in 49 of the 50 states. They're actually introduced to Hawaii. And uh, whitetail deer hunting is incredibly popular and incredibly uh, uh, marketable. Uh, everybody needs a, no, a new gadget when they're, when they're deer hunting. And these cameras can be very useful. So think about what you can get from them. Not only would you get a picture of the deer itself and I do want to tell you uh, this was this was a picture from this summer. You see the date at the bottom, August second, and uh, my dad's been drooling over this deer. We've been watching him progress. This is on his property that he primarily uses for for deer hunting. So we we, we know the quality of the animal that's there, and we sort of can try to try to see what his movements are. What time of day are we getting the pictures? What when when is it moving? Sort of thing, and and how many different cameras are we getting him on? So we kind of pattern him pattern him that way. Cameras can range in price from about $30 to about 600. And these are just ones that are commercially available. Like you could custom, you, sky's the limit if you wanted to custom make one. The, the, the $30 cameras uh, were available at Walmart. I'm not sure uh, if they still have them in, in stock this year. And the pricey cameras is $600. The brand name for those are Reconyx. And those are still the really the gold standard for people. And when those $30 cameras came out, it was such a shockingly low price that I uh, purchased, a, our department purchased four of them. And I did a project with these two students here. And we wanted to evaluate the difference between, as you see on the poster there, expensive versus budget. We literally took four of the most expensive cameras that we already had in the department and pitted them against the four cheapest cameras that we could get at Walmart. And uh, there were some differences, as, as you would guess. And I did have somebody push back on me and say, why would you do a study like this? Obviously, $30 cameras are not going to 
be as good as $600 cameras. And I said, right, but are they 20 times as bad? Is the $600 camera 20 times better than the $30 camera? And that was a, an interesting way to think of that. So in, in some regards, it, uh, it really depends on what your goal is. So do you buy 20 cheap cameras or do you buy one expensive one? We'll talk about that uh, in a slide or two coming up here. I did mention that you can customize these. The people that build their own cameras are DIY uh, camera traps. They they call them home brews, which I think is a really clever kind of a term. And if you start googling after the presentation, you're not going to do it while I'm talking, are you? After the presentation, if you start googling some amazing camera trap photos, you're going to see stuff that looks like it was done in a studio. So these are people that are taking, you know. Uh, uh, DSLR cameras and putting them in waterproof boxes and connecting flash units to them and setting up the perfect kind of a situation. And I've never done any of that. I have no interest in the electronic side of things. And uh, quite frankly, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with what I can buy over the over the counter. And then the last uh, piece on this slide here is to talk about all the other things that you should or could buy along with your camera trap. So it's a little bit like owning a car, right? It, there's one expense of, of actual the actual purchase, but then you got to put gas in it. You got to get insurance on it, apparently in New York, and you got to get oil changes, new tires, the same thing with these cameras. So they eat through batteries. You, you have to have at least one SD card. It's helpful to have two so you can swap them right in the field. Some people buy those card viewers so they can look uh, in real time right outside and, and see what they've got. And then I also recommend uh, cable locks and security boxes. Uh, and along with, with that, sometimes we use scent or, or bait, some, some sort of lure to get the animal to come to us. And I have quite a, a library of books available as well. I bolded security box there because I wanted to remind myself what the next slide was coming up. So um, I've the, the animal that's most mischief when it comes to my cameras is raccoon. Raccoons are just, they've got those human-like little hands, right? And they can just manipulate stuff. The animal that's most destructive when it comes to cameras is a black bear. So I came upon my, uh, my camera. This is a personal camera of mine. This is one of those <clears throat> five to $600 models. And it's hanging wide open like this, exposed to all the elements. And I can see mud on top of it there. Maybe you can see that as well. And thankfully, one advantage of having an expensive camera is they're built very well. So this camera is still functioning. I have it out on my property right at the moment. Um, in this case, it was down in Steuben County on my dad's property. And when I pulled the SD card, this was the last image that I could see after it went black. So I know who the culprit was. It wasn't just any bear. It was that bear right there. So if I had put this, I, I can kind of go back one. You can see that it's locked to the tree. There's a cable lock on it. So no one could steal it. But I, if I had had a metal box in it, well, a, a bear might not have been able to meddle with it either. This is sort of the last uh, bit that I want to talk about these cameras sort of just in general. I, I felt like I had to give everybody at, at least, you know, I don't know if I've got anybody out there that's never even heard of these things before. So here's my which one to buy slide. Please notice that there's nowhere on here where it actually tells you which one to buy because I don't know what your main goals are. That might be hugely different if you want to buy a camera for home security, let's say. You want to, you want to put one in your backyard and you want to make sure uh, you know what's going on. Um, it's important to know how the quality of the image is to you. So more and more of these cameras are getting better and better at lower prices. Um, but if you absolutely want high quality images consistently, you really need to spend a bit more. I want to uh, address your attention there to those wood ducks. This is in my pond in the in the back field. And the camera that took that picture, and it's a pretty good picture, nice color, uh, pretty good focus there. That's about a $130 camera, just to give you a perspective there. Um, anything cheaper than that, and you're going to get lots of blurry pictures, but maybe some good ones in, in between, if, if high quality is your, is, your, uh, is your goal. Do you want to just take still photos, or do you want video as well? If you want video, do you need audio to go with it? These are actually uh, questions that you really have to think about. And then what's your budget? I've, I've sort of addressed this before and you see it here at the bottom. If, if you had 
two hundred dollars to spend should you buy two one hundred dollar cameras or, or buy one two hundred dollar camera and it sort of depends on on what kind of person you are and what kind of tolerance you have for blurry images the best website that I can address uh, for you here is trailcampro.com. They review cameras, they, they're very thorough. I think they're unbiased and they give you probably more information than you'd ever want. Uh, but another piece of advice certainly could be to ask other cam trappers. So I belong to a couple uh, Facebook groups of trail camera folks, and there's constantly questions on there. Hey, I'm new to this, what camera should I buy? And it's nice hearing from people uh, right in the field of, of what they're they're interested in. I was trying to think of how many different brands of camera I have, and I think I've owned at least a dozen different brands, and I probably have six different brands running right at the moment. Okay, here's some tips on how to use these things. So let's assume you're already a camera trapper and uh, you've got at least one of these. And these are three that are just, you know, like these are no brainers. So I would recommend that you look for wildlife sign that's already there instead of sort of just relying on putting out bait or scent to draw the animal to you. And there's two reasons for that. One, it makes you a better camera trapper if you start noticing where the wildlife is around you. So you will start noticing good sets because you're looking for track and sign. Uh, and then second, I really think it's much more rewarding. So there's something about putting out, you know, a, a pile of apples and then getting a picture of a deer like, oh, well, what, what, what are the odds? But there's another thing to finding a, a nice trail in the thick brush and, and say, I think this is going to be really good for deer. And sure enough, you're, you're right. Most uh, sites will tell you not to point your camera south because the sun always has a southerly aspect to it. And so there'll be a time when your camera's pointing directly into the sun and uh, you'll either get pictures that are all washed out because the sun is overexposing it or you'll get false triggers because that heat from the sun really uh, fools the camera. And I'm a vegetation trimmer. Like I don't, I don't have. A, I'm not sawing down redwood trees, but I don't have any problem with pulling up some some small small vegetation here and there to help make a picture a little bit better. That'll also uh, avoid those those false triggers there. All right, I've got two last tips, and these are better tips. These are ones that require a little more a little more discussion. I almost always set my cameras knee high or lower. I'm not very good when it comes to getting uh, pictures of white-tailed deer with the antlers right in the middle of the picture all the time because I like setting my cameras low. That way I'm going to get pictures of skunks and woodchuck and raccoon where a deer hunter might want to not waste batteries or SD cards on any of that and absolutely wants to see the, the headgear. Also, look how dramatic this photo is. Like This looks like an album cover to me. These guys are about to drop the hottest album of 2020, I think. And, and all it takes is being below the eye level of the animal. So that's a trick that any uh, wildlife photographer would, would tell you. And it even works when the animal has its head down. So even this black bear, like he's, his eye level is right at the camera, but that's only because his head is down. This is still a dramatic looking image. He looks big, he looks rough here coming, coming towards the camera. Of course, when I was in South Africa, setting a camera at knee height really caused some problems at times. I mean, there was no way I was going to get the head of these giraffes anyway, but my goodness, it really reminded me that knee high works in some places better than better than others. <laughs> okay. And my last tip, if, if I could only do one thing for you folks today that have cameras is encourage you to set them on logs. So logs are just natural runways for so many animals, even animals you wouldn't expect like coyotes just just get found on these things all the time. And I think some of it is because they're they're. Uh, their prey is there. So this is a log set that we have at East Hill Campus. And I've got this one zoomed in and you can't quite tell in this picture, but this log is suspended. It's actually a tree that's tipped over. It's still connected to the roots, um, but this is, uh, I can crawl underneath this log. It's not, not on the ground here. And uh, I just pulled this with one of my interns 
a, a while ago and we had it set since August. We just, I didn't pull the camera, just, sorry, just pulled the SD card. And there's the, the, the prey and here's the predator. So this is a, a short-tailed weasel. Uh, weasels, uh, the long-tailed and short-tailed, the mustelas, are both known as mousers. And if you look at this guy, if we go back a little bit and come here, they're much, much longer than the mouse, but they're no fatter around. So both our long-tailed and short-tailed weasel can fit into any hole that a mouse can fit into. So mice have to always be on guard knowing that they have a predator that can squeeze into the exact same place that they did. That's our smallest weasel in the Finger Lakes. This guy's pretty much tied for our biggest. So River Otter and Fisher are, are about the same size and get to be about four feet long. And I recognize that this is a bit of a blurry picture, but that Fisher's moving here. And we have the camera set to take a burst of three images. So as soon as it gets triggered, it'll take one, two, three. And if the animal's still there, it'll take a quick breath and then take three more pictures. And if the animal's still there, it'll take a quick breath and take three more pictures. So I have about 45 images of this fisher on this log. And now you can see in the bottom right corner that it is a suspended log here. And he's scent marking, he's rolling his chest onto the, the uh, uh, log. Now he's biting at the log a little bit. And sometimes they do that just to rough up the surface so that their scent uh, gets left behind a little bit, a little bit better. And then he comes back, sort of doing a seal imitation there and then stopped and gave us this fantastic look. I mean, if I took that picture with my own camera, I would be talking about that for years. What a great sighting that would be. I can't always be out there. I'm so glad I've got eyes in the woods when, when I'm, I'm not there. The log can be on the ground as well. Doesn't have to be suspended like that. So this to me is a log set, even though it's on a trail, I purposely put this camera where there's a, a log and you can see uh, mom and a couple cubs here. Now take a look at the two holes that are below that cub's feet. Those holes were made by a specific kind of woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker. And I'm certain that those two holes were made when this was still standing. So before this was a log, it was a snag and the pileated woodpecker uh, dug into it and was eating the, the uh, insects that were inside the dead tree. And then tree fell over and I, I set a camera here. And I still get pileated woodpeckers to come, but they don't dig holes like that anymore. When, when, when they're feeding on a, on a horizontal log, they leave a sort of different sign than they do when it's vertical. I can't turn this into a track and sign uh, presentation, but I'm giving it a try, aren't I? Let me show you two pictures here. So here's a pileated woodpecker and I've got it spelled out for you in case, uh, in case you're not, not happy with my, my accent. And here he is with no head. Well, that's not really true, right? Like if your screen is, is good enough, you can see the head there. He's got uh, uh, just a blur of a head here. We're catching him in motion. He's hammering away at this, at this log and I can see basically a strip of red and a strip of white. If we go back, that's what I'm looking at, the white on the face and the, and the red on the crest there. Does that help put it in motion for you? Oops, sorry. So sometimes my students and I talk about why the images look like they do. And we talk about how the image gets written onto the SD card. And you can see that it doesn't quite know how to deal with it when it's in motion. This is what it looks like when it's in fast motion. It literally almost disappears. Here's what happens when the animal's moving slower. So uh, not a log set, but this is a, a motion set here. I'm gonna show you. This gray squirrel gets captured just as he decides he's gonna launch from this tree to the tree that my camera's on. And it, it got written onto the SD card like this. Okay, that is like the longest back legs on any gray squirrel ever, right? Clearly, he's got normal back legs. This is stretched out like this because of how the image gets written onto the SD card. So you need to be careful when you're reviewing these images. They can give you a false sense of, of reality there. That's definitely a false sense of reality right there. 
you know, when I was trying to put this together, I thought I could really do a series of a couple of these because I use my cameras in so many different ways. I, I, I use them personally. I have eight cameras that I run um, constantly uh, 365 days a year, and I use them in, in teaching. And then I also have been a part of, of research. Now, I'm going to explain to you how I use research within my teaching, but I'm also going to give you some examples of research projects that were beyond what we did here at FLCC that I've been involved with just on, on a very small scale. The one use for camera traps that I can think of that I have no, uh, no part of is security. There are definitely are people that use cameras like this, like a ring doorbell, for example, I think would count as a, as a camera trap because you're remotely sensing uh, your, your, uh, your, your, your creature, <laughs> usually a human, right? Okay. Let me give you some examples of camera trap research in the Finger Lakes. How's everybody doing? We're at about 730. We've got about two and a half hours to go. This was a picture that was not taken by me. This was taken by one of my former students. Her name is Elena Burns, and she left FLCC, uh, eventually ended up at ESF, uh, soon ESF in Syracuse, uh, on a master's project. And she wanted to study river otters. So I was one of the, her committee members and helped her design her project. And one of the things that I want to explain to you guys as we go through this research part is you have to think about these images now as data. So when Elena would retrieve her camera, she was gathering data. She wasn't getting pretty pictures. She was getting data. The pretty picture part comes second. So let's, let's blow up this picture a little bit and just have a quick look. So obviously there's some easy data here. So on the top left, you've got a date there. Um, this was all the way back in September of, of 2012. Um, th th this picture was taking that 723 and 26 seconds in the morning. So that's some easy data there. If we go to the top right corner, you can see that these cameras detect uh, temperature. And there's a half moon cookie right next to that temperature there, which is making me, me hungry. I got a bit of a sweet tooth. That's actually the phase of the moon. So I told you that these cameras are, are really driven by the deer hunter market. And if there's any deer hunters that are watching me right now, you probably know that there are people that, that really subscribe to this idea that deer movement can be tied to the phases of the moon. And they really can predict that. And I've met lots of people that absolutely swear by that. It's also useful to know the temperature. That's an easy thing to add to it. So they, they add that as well there. Uh, I've never had a student do anything personally with the, the moon phase data, but I have had students investigate the temperature uh, side of things and, and do projects with that. So that's your data. The rest of the data is the image itself. So we could look at the behavior of these particular otters, but, but let's just look at something even simpler. How many otters are here? Have, have you been just staring at these guys the whole time? So you should have been able to find everybody. There's one, two, three, four. And then did you see the Lorax looking one over there on the left? What we can properly say here is that there were at least five otters here. We don't know that there were exactly five because we're never sure what happens just off screen, but we know for sure there were at least five. I was not really involved with this project at all, other than to uh, uh, shadow Catherine Sun for a day in her research. And then she actually used my father's uh, property as one of her study sites there. Um, this was Catherine uh, many years ago, probably a good, good eight, eight years ago as well, um, when she was doing her master's research at Cornell. She has just finished up her data collection for her PhD. And I'm looking forward to seeing that, that get, get printed as well, because she did another, another project that involved camera traps. So let me explain what, what her deal is. You can see the barbed wire in both of the pictures here. Um, she set out um, bait stations essentially for black bears and she surrounded the bait station with barbed wire. So on the left there, you can see all the hostess donations, all the expired, they still taste good, by the way, I just wanna make sure you know, 
all the expired that they can't sell um, bakery products that, that she was donated. And then her assistant, I can't recall his name. I only met him that one day. It looks like he's pouring maple syrup on that tree. And that, that was that was just a jug they were reusing. They had a 55 gallon drum of molasses. And so they were bringing out one gallon at a time. And you can see the bait in that mesh bag above it there. And then the molasses would draw the bear in as well. And as the bear would come in to the bait, it would have to cross the barbed wire and leave some of its DNA behind. And you can see Catherine very carefully in that picture on the right hand side using a white envelope behind the barb and using a pair of tweezers to not contaminate the DNA of the black bear and, and uh, plucking it out and then putting it into the envelope. Then she would use a lighter to sterilize the tweezer and then move on down and try to try to find as much hair as she possibly could. We don't call them barbed wire fences in the research folks. We call them hair snares. So that's the that's the term there. And then you can see her picture on the left where she is setting up a, a trail camera inside of a metal box because bears and has a padlock on it because people. So that was that was her, her setup. And I told you she used my dad's property uh, for one of her study sites. So she graciously let me set my camera up on that one. And here's just two images from it. Um, you can see the bear on the left was a little mischievous and, and got into the barbed wire as well. I, I, I must tell you their hide is so thick that this it doesn't injure them what's, whatsoever. My question to you is, if her goal is to collect DNA samples, what what could she possibly using the camera traps for? Again, I can't see you or see the chat. So if you're trying to answer me, I do appreciate that. And maybe your fellow uh, fellow uh, folks can can see that, but I I can't. I'm gonna have to just bide my time here as I give you a few more seconds to think about it. Well, eventually she's gonna have to defend this research. Right, either when she goes to publish it or or when she just is defending her her uh, her thesis, and somebody's going to ask the question, "How do you know that you got hair from every bear that came and visited?" And the answer, of course, is you don't know. But because I had a subset of my hair snares with a camera on it, I can tell you, and she actually did say this in her defense, that. I never got a picture of a bear on the camera trap and not get hair on the barbed wire fence. Did I just say that correctly? I think so. So she didn't have a camera at every single one of these, but the ones she did have, they always produced hair whenever they produced photos. So that was a good indication that if they weren't 100% accurate, they, they, were, they were certainly certainly close to that. And then finally, another project that I helped out with was the New York State DEC Fisher Presence Study. I don't know what they actually called it, but presence is the is really what it was. Um, you know, I've just showed you some pictures of, of Fisher from East Oak Campus, and maybe you know that Fisher are increasing here in our part of the world uh, where I'm at here in the in the Finger Lakes, and the DEC wanted some data on where where the fisher were beyond just eyewitness sightings road kills they needed something that was more systematic so you can see on the left there what the setup was they hung a piece of bait inside of uh, some chicken wire and the bait they used was actually beaver meat do you know why they use beaver meat because when they do nuisance trapping in the summer they end up with all of this meat that has to be disposed of it, it can't be used because it's nuisance trapping so they ended up having this free source of, of bait for the fishers your your tax dollars being used used responsibly and then around that bait you can see some plastic strips with some gun brushes in there these are brass brushes that you would use they look like they're probably 22 for a 22 rifle and you would use that to clean the barrel of the gun while well, they're using it as miniature hair snares. They're not only getting photos of the fisher, but they're also gathering uh, uh, DNA samples and Cornell eventually uh, went through those or, or maybe still is in the process to be honest with you. And so that map that you're looking at does look kind of weird, it, it, but maybe if I can put it in perspective, 2015 is written right in the middle of Lake Ontario. Here's Lake Erie off to the left and you're basically looking at Western and Central, 
uh, New York. Uh, the Adirondacks are chunked off. The Catskills are chunked off. We got rid of New York City and Long Island completely gone. No, not even a chance to be on the map here. And anywhere where there was a yellow box, they had a camera but got no detections. Anywhere where there was a red box, they, they got a detection. They might have gotten 20 detections, but it still is a one and a zero. It's, it's done binary. You're either present or not. And that's what the one and the, and the zero mean. So this was, this was done over uh, several different winters, and it was a way for them to show that Fisher are, are present in our area in high enough numbers to warrant a, a trapping season uh, down along the southern tier. So that image was fantastic of that fissure, but but then we got images like these as well. And although I, I really wasn't a big part of this project at all, um, I did get sent these as asking for another opinion. Can we get an outside opinion? And I'm not sure you can even see this one. So the, 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 the black and white photo on the left taken at night with an infrared flash um, that has the, uh, the bait there and below the bait, there's the animal, dark animal in the branches. The uh, image to the right, which is taken with an incandescent flash, so it's in color, the animal is running on the ground to the to the right of the tree as we're as we're facing it here. So um, both of them were were iffy creatures, and I just wanted to point out that uh, sometimes doing camera trap work can be frustrating. Well, for, for three winters, FLCC students and staff adopted four of the cameras. They had four cameras around the Naples area, and we agreed to take those. They gave us a giant bag of beaver meat to put in the freezer, and uh, they only have the cameras in place for about four weeks. So it wasn't like a huge time commitment for us to go once a week and check four cameras. So that was, that was kind of fun, and it was great for my students to be part of a very large project that was going to have very big uh, implications. Cool. Hey, I think I'm doing okay in time. I don't know. How do you guys feel? Do you, you know, I assume you're getting up to stretch if you need to, uh, but still listening and still watching. You do some, do some yoga behind your chair a little bit if I'm, if I'm, I'm getting a little too, too long winded for you. Let me hone right in now on how we use camera traps in the classroom at FLCC. Uh, I have a student setting a camera here on the right. He's got a piece of cardboard clipped to it with a, a clothespin so that we don't uh, take a million pictures of us. So you just got to remember to take the cardboard with you as you leave, says the man who's made that mistake once. Okay. And a lot of what we end up doing with these pictures, whether it's a picture that I took with class like this one in our CON, CON 190 conservation field clamp class is mostly just to talk about how the cameras work, but, but also to take those images and then continue to use them in other classes for identification purposes. This, this, is, this is our fisher again. And just look how fantastic that picture is. Of course, I'm going to use that picture over and over and over and over and over again. By the way, that picture was taken with an $85 camera that I got on a Black Friday deal a few years ago for $60. And it's still chugging along. It's, it's, a, it's a good little camera. Um, and I can pull out all the engaging photos and get to use those. My, my students get, get to be right here. I've got students who might be from Seneca Falls, where, where I live, and, and have an extra connection to this sort of a picture beyond just me pulling stuff off of the internet. And, you know, some of the pictures can be a bit graphic as well. So this is a part of nature. We talk about great blue herons and the fact that they mostly eat fish, but sometimes eat bullfrogs. You also never know what you're going to get in, in these cameras, and I don't preview them on purpose. Like a lot of times we'll pull SD cards and we'll go look at them right away. And uh, rarely have I been uh, been disappointed in doing that. And sometimes you get something like this, like I, I don't have any interest in purging this information from my students, but I, I got a picture here of a deer with a broken front leg. And if you look at that leg, so this deer is facing us. So it's on the right of the picture. So it's the left leg of the deer. Have a look at the right antler of the deer, the opposite side. So you see how that antler is misshaped. The leg injury on one side of the body will cause a misshaped antler on the other side. It's absolutely fascinating how that works. And, and I think, you know, these injuries just, some of my students are just, 
you know, torn when they see these. They, they feel this great empathy for, for, the, for the wildlife, but we have a chance to talk about how, you know, in, in the wild stuff, stuff happens. And it probably happens more than you would you would uh, recognize. And uh, some of these these deer, like the, uh, this one with the, the the head injury that's causing one antler to, to droop down like that, um, I, I got pictures of that guy over two years. And that gray fox in the top left with three legs, that that was the male. Here's his here's his mate. They raised five cubs successfully. Kits, pups. Not cubs. Sorry, I'm still thinking of bears. So even though you know we you can you can empathize for that gray fox, you can also be be excited that it, he's living a productive life and fathering a generation of of new gray foxes for Seneca Falls. Sometimes I use the images and just sort of let this story speak for itself here, like this one. I put a little bit of scent on this rock, and not only did it attract this fawn but it attracted its mom. And it's just like, like you know, you can tell students how little fawns are or how big uh, the uh, whites are as adults, but just something like this is really gonna stick with them. And, and remember, I'm competing with, you know, fancy Photoshop and TikTok and the, the, whole, the whole World Wide Web. I gotta come up with stuff that's, that's kind of interesting to them. We do a lot of side-by-side -side comparisons for identification. So this was a set that I had at our Mueller Field Station. And I've got two members of the weasel family here. And I teach my students to pull them up side-by-side -side so they can compare them. And so let's zoom in. And we're looking at a mink on the left and a mustela on the right. We talked about them already. This is either a long-tailed or a short-tailed weasel. Very, very difficult to tell from a picture here. If you had to make me guess, I would guess short tail weasel, but uh, I'm certainly not not sure. And then we can elaborate on why those are are who they are. That, that that's how we would use them in class. But my absolute favorite way to do this is to find a way that I can actually blend a photo. So in this particular case, did have you seen all three squirrels on this tree yet? I've blended three photos together, and it's very very seamless. I. I didn't do anything to try to trick anyone into believing that the red squirrel, the eastern chipmunk, and the gray squirrel were all on this tree at the same time. It just so happened it was an overcast day with the shade of the forest above it, and the lighting just stayed the same. Boy, they really do, really do sit there. And we can compare the size. We can compare the color. In some cases, we can compare other other features as well. It's just a fantastic way to do it. Very easy to do in PowerPoint. If there's any teachers out there or anybody that wants to learn how to do it, I could, uh, if if you request that, I could put together a quick video for you and and uh, and shoot that to you. Um, so here's one that I blended, um, but you can see the seam very easily. It's right in the middle of the picture. Your eye is just drawn to it. The sunlight was so strong on the crows on the right. And by the time the raven got there on the left, uh, it was more overcast or later in the day. But what a great picture. I'm literally comparing the size of a common raven and American crow for you right here. And uh, this is, this is a, a fantastic learning tool. And, and sometimes it goes beyond just the identification. So this, <laughs> this gray squirrel and mink were literally 90 seconds apart. Uh, this is in one of my hedgerows here on my property in Seneca Falls here. And the seam again is pretty hard to find because the pictures were so close together that the lighting didn't change at all. And we can talk about how they're very similar in size. And uh, we can talk about what might have happened if that mink was a little bit slower and got there at the same time that the gray squirrel instead of instead of 90 seconds before the before the gray squirrel. I just wanted to throw this one out. I put this one into my dad. He's he's uh, crossbow hunting uh, right here, but uh, uh, he was not there at the same time that deer was. And then just so my dad's not the only one that gets picked on, here's one of me and a and a black bear. So both looking at that tree with some great interest. And I believe this is my last blended image. 
Sometimes I'll blend them up and then actually use them. So this is one that I use in my field study of birds class uh, in my waterfowl unit. And I'll give this to the students and ask them to identify all the species of waterfowl that are here. Now, obviously, some of them are slightly better blended than others. But again, the purpose is not to fool anybody into thinking I had all these species at the same time. The idea was to create something that's compelling so my students actually pay attention when I talk. All right, <clears throat> now I've told a few stories already, but I did want to spend uh, one one moment here just talking about the value of becoming a storyteller with these with these images. So part of being a storyteller with camera trap images is first finding the story in in the pictures. So uh, I, I can tell you that have, having been working with cameras for over 20 years now, I think I'm better at this than I was when I first started. And I, I challenge my students to find a story in a, that we do a, a, one of my classes, we do a, a quick set for a couple of weeks. And then I tell them there's always a story, find a story in there. And sometimes the stories are more compelling than others, right? There's bestsellers and then there's stories that you have to self publish because you're having a midlife crisis. And, and this, this particular story was one that was really easy for me to tell and one that fits right into my wildlife management class. My dad is in his early 80s now, and he doesn't doesn't hike around as much as he used to when when he was younger when he when he hunts. So we built a blind for him right near this apple tree. And one year uh, we we uh, were checking the SD cards, and these two bucks were coming regularly to this apple tree, as my dad is patiently waiting for October 1st to show up, first day of archery season in New York State. Well, we get down there the night before. And we, we take the ATV to the blind to put some things in there. So the morning will be a little bit easier and there's no apples on the tree. We had staked all of our, all of our eggs in one basket, all our apples in one tree. And we were really, this is where he was gonna hunt cause he just can't, can't get around like he used to. And there's the apples are all gone. And I'm like, I look at him, I'm like, I, I don't know how the apples can all be gone. Like there were, we were just here a week ago checking everything out and there were a ton of apples here. So I pulled the SD card from the camera and two days before we got there, mama bear and her two cubs got there and they devoured every apple on that tree and on that ground. And that's how they were able to do it. The deer couldn't climb the tree, get at all the apples, but the bears did. So what's the story? What, what, what's the, the, the story that I tell with my students? I have an awful lot of deer hunters that show up in my classes that, that tell me, not all of them, but, but a lot of them, that tell me that the law in New York State is pretty stupid. You can hunt near an apple tree, but you can't hunt over bait. You can hunt on the edge of a cornfield, but you can't hunt over a corn pile. And I always ask them, why, why is that a stupid law? And they all tell me it's the same, it's the same, it's the same. So now I tell them this story in class with these pictures. And, and I tell them, you know, baiting just means when the deer eat your apples, you just go to Danny Wegman's place and you just buy another a bushel of them and then dump them out. But when you're hunting by an apple tree and the bears come and eat all of the apples, well, then you're out of luck. You got to hope a deer is going to wander by not knowing that the apples have all been sold out. And, and in addition, this tree provides a place for birds to nest and insects to, to live and photosynthesis. There's, there's so many benefits to an apple tree and literally no benefit to an apple pile other than you having a deer come close to you so you can shoot it. I don't know why I chose that one as a story, but I do, I do like that one. Um, maybe it's the time of year. Hey, how about this one? So my wife teaches a high school class and her classroom is at Geneva General Hospital. Uh, without going into, into this rabbit hole too, too long, she does, uh, uh, she's got students that are interested in going into the medical profession and she does a lot of medical stuff with them. And one of them is a heart dissection. <laughs> so we use deer hearts for the dissection since they're very similar in size and structure to human hearts. And the students love it. We get hunters will, will contribute hearts. Uh, I've contributed a couple over the years. And uh, when she's done, she can't just take those deer hearts and dump them in the garbage, right? Can you imagine being at a hospital and seeing hearts in a dumpster? Like, I, I want to be in the paper, but I don't want to be in the paper for that one. 
So she always brings the, the hearts home and I always dump them in front of a camera. And then we usually share the share the pictures with the students. They sort of see the hearts uh, after after the fact as well. The story goes back all the way to 2009. There's a whole bunch of deer hearts in front of the camera here. And at 418, down here at the bottom, I circled it for you. Red Fox shows up and finds his first deer heart. At 420, the picture on the left, he's back for another heart. Then he comes back at 440 for a third heart. That's because he's caching his food. This red fox can't eat a deer heart that fast. There's no way. So what he's doing is grabbing him and storing him, grabbing him and storing him. And then he came back one last time at 448, grabbed the last heart, and off he went. The very next picture on this camera was that raccoon. At 6.31 in the morning, the sun's just rising. You better get back to probably living in my garage. So I got to get back, back home. And he's got no idea that he missed four gigantic deer hearts there. If the roles had been reversed, if the red fox had come at 4.19, sorry. If the raccoon had come at 4.19 and the red fox had come at 6.31, the, the, the red fox would have found three deer hearts because raccoons don't cache food, but red foxes do. So the red fox stored all those, hit them away, and the raccoon got none. If the raccoon had gotten there first, he would have got one, the red fox would have gotten the rest. So that's a cool thing to, to learn. And then I'm gonna take a pause here and not uh, tell you anything about these other than to ask you, when I zoom in on the one picture, make sure you can see both animals in the picture there. This story really just tells itself. And here's the zoom in. Do you see both the animals? You knew where it was going, right? You knew that was going to happen. So um, that that's a that's a story, and, and uh, you know coyotes got to eat as well. In addition to these compelling natural resource stories, or natural history, excuse me, stories, um, a lot of times you can find the humor in these images as well. So I don't know uh, the age range of the audience that I have out here. I don't know if any parents now have to make make an explanation to their kids, but you're going to have to have a bigger explanation now after after this this picture or, or this one here. Sometimes you got to invent the humor. So this is one of my my alums, Alyssa Johnson, and she was hiking at our East Hill campus, saw one of our cameras and just playfully mugged in front of it. Well, you know, I can't just let that go. So over the years, I think uh, Alyssa has been to more places than Dora the Explorer because I just keep photoshopping her into other other images. So thank you, Alyssa, for that that wonderful uh, wonderful image there. And just just to to make sure you know, I pick on myself as well. I've got thousands of pictures of me pulling cameras with these horrible horrible shots. I, I hope I don't look that bad in, in real life. I make memes. Uh, if you are too old to know what memes are, congratulations for being able to, to get onto WebEx. Uh, but maybe you can ask somebody younger in your in your life what a meme what a meme is. And then uh, this summer, this was a particular meme that that started, I guess, in the in the spring. I should see, you know, when when we first faced our our shutdown. So uh, this is how wildlife biologists would work from home. Is what I a Zoom meeting of all the wildlife and me. Okay, enough of that, that playful stuff. <clears throat> We're down to two last ways that we use the cameras here. And I'm gonna use the term pre-research here. And I like this term. I count anything that is a skill or knowledge that's gonna be needed for an actual research project to be successful. So uh, basically uh, all of the things that you would think of as sound education, like how to be a critical thinker, how does this stuff even work? And, and understanding the strengths and limitations of that specific, uh, in this case, camera trap. Math skills, oh my goodness. I'm just gonna have to just say, oh my goodness here. And really even thinking about how to phrase what you're trying to say. Like it, this is a, a skill set that you need to have. Coherent expression of ideas, says the man that's been stuttering to you for an hour now. Not quite an hour. Don't don't look at your watch. And then, of course, literature searches uh, also need to be done. These are all things that I have my students do 
uh, in service of their education that don't quite rise to the level of research but feel like research to them because they're they're so I don't want to say they're in over their heads, but they're definitely in deep water. They're definitely being challenged um, by me and by by the circumstances um, to really operate outside of their comfort zone. Um, and uh, we get to we get to learn all the terminology that goes along with it here. And a couple of these I've used with you here. I'm, I don't think it's really valuable to go through all of these, but I do want to use the word capture with you. It, we use the term capture anytime we're talking about an image of an animal. So I just had, a, I had one of my interns this afternoon, we were working together on a project and I was asking her, how many captures did we get of deer mice? How many captures of striped skunk did we get? That means how many times did we obtain a, a visit from that animal in front, of the, in front of the camera there? And then maybe it's worth just talking about one more. <clears throat> I, I won't tell you how many species we captured at East Hill campus, I will talk about species richness. And if you think that's just trying to upsell you, you know, make you sound sound uh, impressive because you have a better terminology or excuse me, a better, better vocabulary. How do you screw up having a better vocabulary? That's terrible. Um, this, is the, this is the language of the professionals. These are terms that I learned by reading uh, 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 journal articles. So I want my students to be able to talk like this. I want them to be able to go to a job interview and be able to talk the talk. So uh, some of the ways they do that is through independent projects. Uh, they may have absolutely no connection to a class, but they were excited about something and they, they did it. Uh, that we have internships. Uh, uh, both paid and unpaid. Uh, the gentleman in the canoe with me here, uh, his name is Solomon. Solomon, for his federal work study, uh, he was interested in learning some more about the animals at the at the Mueller Field Station. So we set out a couple cameras and uh, and tried tried our luck at getting some pictures, and he got some really nice otter pictures. Uh, sometimes club ac club activities, and and I probably could come up with a couple more, but I think you get the idea. We have two, I would call them sort of pre-research projects. They could, they could be research if we ever really looked at the data better. Uh, we have five cameras set at our Mueller Field Station and five set at our East Hill campus as a long-term monitoring uh, uh, program. Uh, Bobcat is the image there on the, on the left. That's an animal that first showed up after we owned the Mueller uh, field station. So we did not get an image of a bobcat uh, until we'd had the station for about 10 years. Um, and those uh, cameras at Mueller were funded by the Emil Mueller Foundation and George Fraley, who is the uh, donor of the East Hill campus, uh, uh, was kind enough to, to match that gift with five cameras of their own over at East Hill. Please notice, these are the Reconyx ones. These are the expensive ones. I don't, I don't make any, uh, any uh, excuses for that. They're hardy cameras. They last a long time. They give great results. They're worth every penny for, for our needs. We also have another project that was funded uh, by the Emil Mueller Foundation, and they actually gave us uh, five years of funding for that. So I'm funded through 2024. And I came up with the acronym Finger Lakes Watch. WATCH stands for Wildlife and Trail Camera Hosts. You can't have a good project if you don't have a good, a good acronym, I believe. And notice what I'm talking about here. So the, the way this is supposed to work is um, we, we either contact uh, people or people contact us or agencies we've, we've worked with. Montezuma Audubon Center, as you can see, Finger Lakes National Forest, Finger Lakes Land Trust and the Burgeon Swamp Society, uh, for examples, uh, along with private landowners. And we have five cameras that we will bring to you, set out on your property for two to three weeks, and then we will generate a data a data driven report for you on, on what we find. Now, if you have your own cameras, maybe this there's no value to this for you. But if you don't have your own cameras, this is a great way for you to to get some some images and get some idea of what what you got crawling around out there. We do because the, the college uh, also gave us some some support towards this. We do focus on Ontario, Yates, Seneca, and Wayne because that's the college's uh, four service uh, area, uh, four four county service area. Excuse me, um, but we don't have to exclusively stick to that. Um, and it's it's really a great a great project. The idea of you as the landowner 
hosting wildlife is is what gave me this whole idea like I, there there's something that i teach my wildlife management students about the united states and the difference between wildlife management on federal or state lands and wildlife management on private lands and we really need to engage private landowners and get them excited about hosting wildlife so that's part of the the joy of this is we'll put out the cameras and say thank you for hosting all of these animals you hosted our cameras for a couple of weeks so we can show you what animals you you host in turn and i told you i was working with one of my interns today this is laura and uh, you can tell this is a, a a recent photo we don't we don't normally mask up when we're camera trapping that's a that's a pandemic rule and we uh, just pulled cameras last week from a finger lakes land trust property and you can see the layout we tried to spread the cameras out in different habitats different situations i of course created a log set as well and uh, laura is now in the process of going through some of the data so we can write the report and send it to the to the finger lakes land trust um, this is some of some of what she has to go through. Um, she is uh, using those fancy terms like latency to detection and capture and and this and that. And then the landowner uh, gets the the report along with an explanation of of how to read it. And and uh, Laura has the benefit of being able to look at a, a field guide that I created. Um, if she's having a hard time identifying some of the images, and uh, the pictures uh, the pages of the field guide are images of the animals and, and what to look for and here's what we got here's some of the stuff we got i thought you'd like to see so anyway uh last week uh i pulled cameras for my con 216 wildlife management class that i keep talking about and yesterday we sat in class with laptops and we tried to come up with an estimate of how many deer are on campus at, at FLCC. So we had six cameras out for two weeks. We had them uh, uh, lure, we had lure, not, not bait, you can't, can't bait white-tailed deer in New York. So we had sent lure in front of the cameras to try to draw the deer in. And what you use is the unique bucks to unlock the key. Because, did I say unlock the key? that doesn't make sense just erase that in your head we use the unique box because you can't tell the does apart right you can't tell the antlers do you can't tell the young of the year apart you can't tell the does apart but you can tell all the bucks apart so you identify how many unique bucks you have then you create a ratio for bu which stands for bucks unique over buck pictures total we know how many doe pictures total we have those are easy we have an unknown no and that's uh, doe unique so we make the assumption that bucks and does visit the camera at equal rates and so we can calculate all three of those and then we estimate the unique number of does add the unique bucks to the unique does and you have how many deer are on campus it's it's not perfect but it's a great study it gets the students to be looking at these images as data it gets them to be careful observers and start trying to tease apart one eight point buck from from another eight point buck it, it gets them to really look at antlers and how weird some of those things really are and then it forces them to do math they don't want to do math but it forces them to do it and then that brings us to our really our last bit of this which is using the cameras for undergraduate research. If you would prefer to call it a field study, I'm okay with that. But uh, a simple definition of undergraduate research would be uh, an original contribution to the discipline. Notice that it doesn't say that it really rises to the level of publication. I am not expecting my students to publish their work, but we should be able to give some sort of a contribution. Do something systematic where the outcome is unknown. And, and that's going to be of value to them. So think about that project that we just did. I just explained to you. There's no way that that was done with enough rigor for us to get into the Journal of Wildlife Management. But, but it certainly was a, a contribution. And we systematically investigated how many deer were there. And we had no idea what we were going to come up with until we actually did it. So all of that works. By the way, uh, I have been involved, uh, Jim Hewlett, 
uh, uh, works at FLCC and he has written so many grants to the National Science Foundation, millions and millions of dollars to do undergraduate research work, both here and create an entire network uh, of undergraduate uh, community college institutions. And I've been blessed to be able to go around to different states and be able to teach other uh, community college instructors on how to use these cameras for research in their, in their uh, classrooms. And this is a picture of a red fox. This is a melanistic red fox uh, that I got in Wyoming when I was teaching a class of community college uh, teachers uh, out by Grand Teton. Here are just some simple things that I could do with my students as field study projects. Really easy. And all of these are phenological, which means something seasonal, something cyclical. That, that, that depends on, on, on time. So antler growth, do you know when antlers start to grow? Well, you can look that up in a book or you can set out some cameras and really find out when they do that right here in the Finger Lakes. Do you know when antlers harden off, when the velvet's gone? Do you know when antlers drop? All of those are questions we can answer with cameras. Mating or other related activity, um, migrations, uh, even just something as simple as when do white-tailed deer lose their winter coat? And one of my favorites is this emergence from hibernation, because I bet you were thinking about bears, but I was thinking about Ewoks, or I mean woodchucks. This is a woodchuck in my backyard, and I've set out cameras on this hole uh, for several different years to see when I get my first capture. And it turns out that woodchuck day, do you know that holiday woodchuck day? You probably call it groundhog day, but groundhogs and woodchucks are the same animal. Turns out early February is actually a very appropriate time to celebrate woodchucks because they do first emerge from, from their winter sleep around then. They, they also may go back in like the whole Puxitani Phil seeing a shadow sort of thing. So, so it's really an interesting, interesting phenomenon to study. I do want to get in into this just for a second and say that all of my research experiences that I do with my students are all part of the course. So we call that a cure, a course undergraduate research experience. So in other words, the students in, in what I'm about to describe to you are all taking a class where research is just another teaching technique. I'm not doing research just to do research in these cases. I'm doing research because it's an excellent way to teach my students. And here's three classes, uh, only one of which that I teach where the students do some sort of a research project as part of their normal course load. The class that I teach that uses this is black bear management. And in this class, we learn um, all things black bear. We learn all about their natural history, how they're managed in New York State, um, and, and then we get to participate in a couple ongoing research projects. In the spring of the year, we get to go with the, with the state biologist and go to bear dens. And while we're there, we collect data on the dens, we collect data on the cubs, the DEC collects data on the sow, uh, the, the female, and then we leave cameras behind. So I've, I get my students to design their own original research question here. They don't get to manipulate the cameras, they don't get to do anything besides use the, the, the cameras that are there, but the benefit they have is years and years of previous bear dens to also draw on. And it's amazing to me, this class fills up every single year. And every year I get students that come up with questions that no other student before them has asked. And I think that's just amazing. And that speaks really well to how you can just take this one pile of data, these images, and mine it for research over and over and over again. You know, besides just being able to handle black bears at these dens, which should make you jealous enough, I get to work with my former students, both of the, the technicians at this bear den and the biologist were all former students of mine. These, this is a quick photo as the cubs were being put back into the den. Mom is chemically immobilized. Um, here she is uh, uh, before they put the head covering over to protect her, her eyes. You can see she's got a big, huge chest blaze here. This was a gigantic bear. She weighed over 300 pounds. That is enormous for a female in our area. And she had four cubs, as you can see. So she was super healthy. She gets chemically immobilized. The cubs do not. Um, we take measurements of the cubs. Uh, and the female, in this case, 
she was given a, a, not a radio collar, but an ear tag that had a radio transmitter in it so they could relocate her again. Here's a couple images uh, from bear dens uh, that, that with some interesting uh, kind of behaviors. So here's a bear inside of her den and notice what she's doing. She's eating snow uh, without leaving the den. She's using that super long tongue that they have that they use to mop up ants and she's, she's licking up snow here. This behavior was actually first discovered in 2006 by camera trappers in Virginia. Here's that same sow moving one of her cubs. Now, I don't know how comfortable this looks to you, but this is the proper way. She's got the cub scruffed and she's carrying it to a, a more of a day den. So she can just move faster than her, than her cubs. So she picks them up and moves them in this case. And then once they're there, they're gonna start, start moving around on, on their own. You can see she's got a collar. You can see she's got ear tags. And you can also see she's walked past one of my cameras already there on that wooden stake. You know, I talked before about sometimes the images are, are kind of, kind of not, not what you'd like to see. We watched on camera, not, not live, right? But when we pulled the SD card, this sow, this is the one that I had showed you before that had the four cubs and that beautiful chest blaze tangle with a porcupine. Somehow a porcupine came into her den and she got a snout and an armful of porcupine quills. So this was an interesting study. I actually had students last year that looked at this and they tried to count the number of quills and then look over time at how long it took before those quills eventually were no longer visible. Now, I can't say for sure that she pulled everyone out and, and didn't break some of them, but, but let me just show you a picture of her later in the season. She's got, there's no quills evident whatsoever. This is after she had already tangled with the porcupine. So she, she, as far as we can tell, she fully recovered from that. What a fascinating, fascinating little, little look into their lives. Tough life out there as, as a wild animal. All the students in this class are required to do a poster and then they're required to present their posters uh, on campus. We have a, a nice session. Uh, the posters are all laid out. It's very well attended. Usually folks from the DEC actually come as well and look at it. And it really, it really is high quality work here. Uh, my students do, do a great job. Well, if you're interested in seeing some more of my specific stuff and hearing some of my stories, I have a blog that I haven't uh, I haven't written anything new in for quite a while, but the stories are are still still timely. Um, it's con102blogspot.com. It's called Backyard Beasts. So if you Google Backyard Beasts, John Van Eel, you should you should get that. And and I could recommend one other thing to you, and that would be this book by uh, Janet Pesataro. I've never met Janet. We've uh, talked numerous times on Facebook. She's in all the camera trap. Uh, groups and this is a fantastic book. So uh, I get students to do the Janet challenge. They will read one of the chapters in her book and then try to get an, a capture of that of that animal uh, using her techniques. So uh, have a look at that. Christmas is coming up. Uh, maybe somebody would like this as a as a gift. I, I don't get any royalties from that, but I I think I'll point that out to you. So questions from you guys. I think I need to unshare. Uh, this so that I might be able to see see your questions, or maybe Allie's going to have to help me out here. All right, John. I don't know if you're able to see the chat or the Q and A box. I can, see, I can see a Q and A box, but it's empty. Okay, so I'm so. going to have to read off some of these to you. Um, one of the questions is, do white-tailed deer and mule deer hybridize? Oh, they actually do. Yep. Uh, Colorado is uh, one of the places where both of those animals uh, uh, inter interact. Uh, and uh, they have a season in Colorado that's just a deer season. So you can shoot a white-tail or a mule deer or a hybrid of, of the two. I've only seen one ever in my life. It was in captivity, but, but I have seen one. That was an easy one. I hope they're all that easy, Allie. Uh -huh. skip, skip the hard ones, would you? All right, let me see. Hold on a 
One sec. What is the most bizarre animal you've caught on trail camera? Once in a while, we'll get pictures of things that don't actually trigger the camera. So like, let's say, for example, uh, I'll be uh, like a deer will walk in front of the camera, but a moth is flying by at the same time. And do you remember that picture of the of the gray squirrel with the really stretched out legs? So the moth will just look like a big squiggly line through the through the air. And that's kind of kind of bizarre. I think the coolest animal that ever triggered my camera was a huge snapping turtle in my back pond. That, that was kind of neat because uh, normally reptiles, uh, you have a hard time because their uh, body temperature, excuse me, isn't always warm enough to trigger, trigger a change. All right. Who can we contact to have cameras set up here at Odonata, Odonata Sanctuary through FL Watch? Uh, you can contact me directly. There's probably, uh, can you cue, can you put that in an answer? Put my email? Yeah, I can do that. You know, I was hoping somebody was going to bite on that. I've been hesitant to uh, advertise that uh, to just a general public audience, um, but thought this would be a good way to do it. We've had no shortage of just simple word of mouth. We're, we're, we're busy, but I'm kind of ready to, to, uh, to expand it a bit and, and see what, what, what happens. So uh, feel free to contact me through, through uh, the email Ali is sharing. Okay. Did I say my email? I meant your email, Ali, share your email. Okay. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding Ali. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, how come when I put bait in front of a camera, something takes it and no pictures? Ah, so, the, the one the one thing that's difficult for me to get in uh, to my students heads is that these things are not foolproof like some of my students think that these things are literally magic you put it out and there's no chance that an animal could go undetected or that there could be any failure from that from the camera so my first recommendation for you would be to uh, set your camera a little bit lower make sure it's low enough that you're capturing something small that comes in like a raccoon or a skunk. And then also maybe tell me what kind of camera you have. And, and I might just say, oh, that's your problem. Like if your camera costs, if, if you spend more on coffee during the week than you did on your camera, then that's your problem. So, uh, but but sometimes it's it, it does happen. It, it can be frustrating. I would even maybe suggest changing the whole setup. Make sure you're maybe go uh, and make sure you don't you don't have uh, uh, a, a chance for the animal to. What am I trying to say? You're in more of a, a close situation. So you got trees overhead, and you've got a tree, and then your bait, and then your camera's on another tree. Like have everything, uh, have everything right in tight like that. Hey, that chat from Gina popped up, but now it disappeared. Yeah, I have to figure that out. Oh, that's yeah. So uh, Gina is one of my former students and just chimed in. She's absolutely correct that uh, these were the first that that was the first round of the ear tags that the DEC was putting into bears because the technology is getting so much better. And it's not the electronics, it's the batteries. So the, the weight of the battery is what is what makes it be a neck collar. But as battery technology improves and improves and the batteries can be smaller and lighter, they, they were able to put put ear tags in so. All right. Have you captured a flying squirrel on camera? I have. I so I only have one picture of a flying squirrel in the air from the camera, and he's just going from like one branch to another. I don't know if I'm actually being shown, but just make a V with your hands and just that tiny little spread. I have a, a, a you know the parachute is open, but I get pictures of flying squirrel all the time that that picture remember that that fisher that was rolling on that log we got flying squirrel running up and down that that log uh, right there flying squirrels are pretty common in our area i don't know where the person asking the question is from but a good rule of thumb for flying squirrel do you notice how i sort of answer a question and then just talk for 20 minutes the good rule of thumb for flying squirrel is if you're seeing gray squirrels during the day you probably have flying squirrels at night at that same spot. So what you just need is a little bit of luck. You need a good enough camera that can detect 
a small a small critter so if you're getting pictures of chipmunks if you're getting pictures of mice just hang in there you'll eventually get a picture of a of a flying squirrel as well try it try a nice log set and see what you see what you get are you good for like a couple more sure okay can you recommend the best batteries to use they can get costly uh, agreed and so my best advice on batteries is to read the recommendations that come with the camera there's something beyond my level of expertise when it comes to electronics but i did read an article that said that you shouldn't automatically think that the lithium batteries are best for every camera apparently there's some electronics that don't they don't even recommend using the lithiums because they won't be that much better but we uh, the cameras the reconyx cameras that we use the bushnells uh, and then the new brownings that we just got last year all of them recommend lithium batteries and they are more expensive as an initial investment but i think over time we spend less because we we don't have to uh we don't have to change them that often just to give you an example we'll put them out at the bear dens and i'll it'll fill the sd card i'll get 25 30 000 images just on one camera and i have to have those batteries you know they they have to last throughout all of that and often they'll 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 be just fine. They'll still read 99% when, even after filling up an entire SD card. So was that, did I answer your question? I do think that the lithiums are worth the money um, unless you have a camera that's telling you not to. Okay. Um, I've got a trail camera on a large hole in a hillside, um, captured raccoons, woodchucks, foxes, possums, skunks, and occasional rabbit all in and out of the same hole how typical is that how typical is it for that to happen well i would say uh first off congratulations that's quite a menagerie right there the story that i've i've told for a long time and i actually had a student who brought me pictures uh with fox and woodchuck coming in and out of the same hole at the same time so that one that one has been documented for a while. I don't know how common that is, but certainly fox and woodchuck in the same hole would be a cool thing for me to see and document, but it wouldn't be new to science. By the way, I see the beaver over Allie's shoulder there in the back. Beaver and river otter have also been documented in the same lodge. I can't imagine what that's like, right? It's like Thanksgiving with the in-laws that you don't like or something like, I, I'm just not sure. But then to add skunk and possum to that mix as well, that that I really have uh, that's a new one for me. I'd love to to really analyze that and see like did the skunk just show up once and then was gone or did he come back and forth? Like that would be a that would be a cool one to to dive into. So it's from my experience that seems that seems unusual to have that many. All right, maybe two more. Sure. Uh, can you can you recommend settings for the trail camera? um for example speed sure so i yes and no so i can tell you that um you, you really every single camera is a little bit different and in, in how they do things and for some of them there's uh you're sacrificing the this you can either have a higher quality image or you can have a faster trigger speed so i would rather have a faster trigger speed because I think I get a clearer picture, even though there's not as many, many pixels in it. So um, in some ways, I'm going to just have to hedge this and say, I feel your pain. Um, but every there's just so many brands of camera out there. And I, and I certainly don't have them all all memorized, but it's well worth it if you don't have the owner's manual to look online for it. And then if you don't have that, you probably could just Google other people that have the same kind of camera and they can recommend settings for you. But I, I understand what you're talking about. And there's there's a, there's sensitivity as well. Do you set it to high sensitivity or medium sensitivity? And all of that is addressed in the, the user manuals uh, for the for the better cameras. And um, I end up I end up basically because I end up doing this a lot with students, we 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 kind of hedge our bet and go towards the middle or or the factory settings often and 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 get decent results that way. I'm sorry that wasn't a very satisfying answer. All right, one more. Uh regarding the unique Buck and Joe project, how often 
If at all, are you slash students able to recognize the same individuals? So uh, this particular year, it was a little bit more difficult with uh, with all, with doing this. So normally I pair them right up and they're working and I'm right over their shoulders and looking at stuff. So this time we're all social distancing and and not not all that perfect, but uh, um, we can identify bucks, I think, with with good regularity. There's certainly going to be images that are that aren't going to work because we can only see a little piece of the antler or the buck is moving and it's all blurry and then there's certainly going to be deer with very similar looking antlers that we probably overlook but if you uh start start digging into it you'll find how unique these these bucks are ellie i don't know if you know it's deer season do you know how to hunt a unique buck You no, no. You unique up on them. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, thanks for saying that. Do you know how to hunt a tame buck? You tame up on on it. That's tame way, tame way. You unique up on. Oh. You have all the good jokes, John, for sure. You know, yeah, <laughs> those are dad jokes for sure. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions. So. We are all set. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, please join us for our future Speaking of Nature series um, events. Like I said, we have one scheduled for December. So just check that out on our Facebook page and Instagram page. And we hope to see you soon. And thank you, John, for joining us tonight. That was great. Thanks everybody.